IMS peace action, nuclear disarmament, and the Peace and Climate Working Groups, also co-sponsored by 350 Massachusetts. We're pleased to hear from four speakers, M.V. Romana, David Kraft, Deb Katz, and Diane Turco. Our time is so brief with such excellent speakers and such important issues, we'll work to keep within our time frame, and I'll give each a one minute warning. After each speaker, there'll be a brief time for a few questions and then on to the next speaker. There'll also be time at the end for questions. We don't have a Q&A function, so please put your questions in chat and please preface it with the word question. Please mute so that we can focus on our speakers. The program is being recorded and a YouTube video will be sent to all who registered and will include action items and resources. I, I see we have so many people here. Please put your information or your organization into the chat, yeah. your actions or upcoming programs on this issue. In addition to organizations represented by our panelists, there are other important resource sources of information. Uh, the Nuclear Information Resource Service and Beyond Nuclear. Please list others. On to our first speaker. M.V. Ramana. Ramana is a Simmons Chair in Disarmament, Global and Human Security and Director of the Liu Institute for Global Issues at the School of Policy and Global Affairs. He will address the small modular reactors. Ramana. Thank you. I uh, really appreciate your inviting me and it's a great honor to be speaking alongside Dave and Deb and uh, uh, Donna, uh, whose work I have, uh, Diane, sorry, uh, whose work I've followed for many years and whose insights I've uh, benefited from. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the latest uh, gimmick from the nuclear industry to try and maintain itself as relevant to the energy and climate conversation, uh, but uh, also point out what the problems there are. Uh, so to Start with, I'll set the stage for where we are with nuclear power globally, and then talk about small modular reactors. Uh, so I want to start by pointing out that the best days of nuclear construction are long ago over. If you look at when nuclear power plants were built and connected to the grid, the maximum number of grid connections uh, happened in the mid 1980s. Uh, in the United States, it peaked in the 1970s. And because nuclear reactors take a long time to uh, come online to be constructed, uh, the orders for these nuclear plants actually came even earlier. So we are dealing with an industry that's really uh, on, uh, on a declining path. And because and what you see after the 1980s is that there are many years when more nuclear power plants have been shut down uh, rather than opened up. So the net result of the fact that there has been very little nuclear construction anywhere in the world is that the share of electricity around the world that nuclear power plants contribute has been declining continuously since the mid 1990s. Uh, the maximum it ever was, was in 1996 when it was about 17.5% and it has declined to about 10% uh, in as of 2020. Uh, just to contrast that, uh, the renewables, modern renewables like uh, solar and wind and biomass and so on have been growing consistently and pretty uh, drastically at that. And uh, a couple of years ago, it overtook nuclear power in terms of share of global generation. The reason for this decline is uh, fairly simple. Uh, nuclear power is not economically competitive. Uh, and reactors cost too much to build. If you listen to the nuclear industry, what they would say is, oh, you know, the reason why we are declining is because there's a lot of opposition. People have, are afraid of nuclear power plants. If they only knew the facts, they would be fine. And that's bogus. 
um, because one wishes that it would actually listen to people and decide on their energy policy democratically. They just don't do it that way, right? Uh, common people don't really get their voices heard unless they really mobilize. Uh, and so most of these trends can actually be explained much better by looking at what it is that the industries care about, the utility companies care about, which is profits and revenue and things of that sort. And nuclear power doesn't do very well for that. So if you look at um, the cost of generating electricity, uh, the Wall Street company Lazard uh, puts out every year uh, an estimate of what different sources of power cost in the United States. In the United States is a particularly important market, not just because uh, it's most of you are there, but also because it is the largest, uh, it, it operates the largest number of nuclear reactors anywhere in the world. And so costs in the United States are a marker for costs elsewhere as well. And if you look at uh, costs in the United States, the cost of generating each megawatt hour of electricity uh, in the US has gone up uh, from $123 per megawatt hour in 2009 to $163. That was the estimate last year by Lazard. Uh, in contrast, if you look at other technologies like solar and wind, those things have been declining very rapidly. Uh, and the net result is that today, the cost of generating a, a nuclear power from a new nuclear plant is about four to five times the cost of generating power from a new solar or a new uh, wind power plant. Oops. In parallel, what we've also seen is that many reactors have shut down because of the high operational costs uh, and again, the cheap alternatives that are happening. Uh, and the only way by which the nuclear industry has managed to keep so many plants operating at point is primarily because they go to their state legislatures and ask for subsidies. And Dave can tell us exactly how this drama played out in, in Illinois uh, with Exelon Corporation. I'm not going to go into those details, but this is all the background to understanding why uh, people would talk about small modular reactors. Uh, but before that, we should also spend a minute to think about uh, the last time there was a lot of hype about nuclear power uh, plants being built, and that was what was called the nuclear renaissance. And this was this phase which started especially in the first decade of this uh, century, especially under the Bush administration, which passed the Energy Policy Act in 2005. And that gave a lot of um, uh, incentives for uh, utility companies to build nuclear power plants. Uh, at that time, uh, there was an expectation that about 30 reactors would be built, or 30, at least 30 orders, and 15, 000, uh, 15 gigawatts of new capacity. That's about 15. Uh, Ramana, you're on mute. Sorry, I made a mistake, Ramana. I oh, muted sorry. you okay. intentionally. My, my okay. mistake. That's okay, sorry. Yeah, so uh, in the nuclear renaissance, it was expected that about 15 new reactors would come online before 2021. Uh, in fact, what happened was only four reactors began construction, two in the state of Georgia and two in the state of South Carolina. Uh, the two reactors in South Carolina were abandoned after about $9 billion. Uh, this is just a direct construction cost, also financing costs, which probably add another $2 billion to that, uh, were spent. And uh, that resulted in Westinghouse, the largest, uh, um, uh, the, the largest supplier of nuclear power plants around the world, uh, filing for bankruptcy protection in 2017 and that project being abandoned. So what's left are exactly two reactors that are being built in uh, Georgia, Vogel, and that's uh, now estimated to cost about $30 billion, more than twice what was the cost estimate when uh, the construction started at uh, that time, it was around $14 billion. And if you look even further back to when the AP-1000 uh, reactors that were being built there were promoted as the answer to nuclear power problems, they were expected to cost a few billion dollars, uh, four, six billion dollars. So we're talking about cost. One minute about left. Five. Oh, oops, sorry. Okay. One minute left, sorry. I'm running really late. Okay, so, um, so this is part of a general trend. I'll just sort of move quickly to the small modular reactors. I'm sorry, I've really spent too much time spending that time. So can small modular reactors solve the problems? Small modular reactors are reactors which are small in terms of how much energy they produce. Uh, and what you find is that all of these designs, they have multiple problems. There are 
cost, uh, high cost, uh, risk of accidents, uh, production of radioactive waste, and the proliferation of nuclear weapons that are associated with nuclear power plants. And it turns out not a single of these designs can actually solve all of these. Um, and the main problem with small reactors is that when you go small, the cost of generating each unit of electricity becomes higher uh, because you use, lose, lose out on what are called economies of scale. And also you produce more waste and use more uh, fuel per unit of electricity generated. Uh, so, and they are also not new. There have been a whole number of them that were built in the United States, which all shut down early because they could not uh, economically compete. As example was this one in Elk River, which I'm not going to talk about. And the last thing which I want to say is that if you look at how the one nuclear plant that has been uh, under uh, development, SMR under development, which is furthest along, called New Scale, New Scale is very delayed from the fact from when it was expected to come online, which is uh, when the company was set up, they were talking about 2015. It's now expected to come online in 2029, 2030. There are problems with the safety of that. And the cost of it is about 80% more than what the cost of Vogel was when it was uh, first um, uh, proposed. So I'll just sort of mm -hmm. end by saying, you know, nuclear power plants are also uh, capable of accidents and waste, which we know all about. Uh, but I'll just say two, uh, two last slides. One is to, should we expand nuclear power to solve climate change? This is the question that keeps coming up again and again. And I want to point out that nuclear power is not desirable for a number of well-known problems. The fact that it can, it can have accidents, it is related to nuclear uh, uh, weapons proliferation and because of the production of waste. And also in terms of, if you look at the timelines for how fast we have to reduce emissions, there is no way nuclear power can contribute and it's very expensive. Sorry for taking too much time. Thank you. Oh no, Romana, thank you so much for all of your information. Uh, and hopefully we can get to some of that information through your questions. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Paula Gutlove and Gordon Thompson, who will handle questions. Gordon is the executive director, Paula the deputy director of the Institute for Resource and Security Studies. The Institute engages in research and public education on energy and international security. Paula. Thank you so much, Susan. And thank you so much, Ramana. So much information and so little time. Um, so I've got two questions and I'm gonna pose them together, I think, and then uh, ask you to try to be brief in your answer. You've got about three minutes. So, we have many well-intentioned climate activists who find themselves looking to nuclear power as the answer to climate change. And uh, they're being led that way by academics that they trust and people that they trust who are telling them this. So how do, how do we address that? That's the first question. And the second question is the costs that you've been talking about um, are the government insurance costs included in the reactor expenses? Because we need to think about what, what's included here. So you're muted. Yeah, very briefly, uh, the costs of, um, let me talk about the costs first. Um, you know, these, the cost of constructing one of these is so great that all of these smaller costs, the cost of waste disposal, the cost of insurance, all of them are relatively small additions to that, right? And you can quibble about whether it's included or not, but that's not gonna change the big argument, okay? So focus on the big picture is what I would say. In terms of climate change, I want to repeat what I mentioned. I mean, the problems with nuclear power, it's risk for accidents, the production of radioactive waste, all of them are well known, right? So. One answer to that is if you're only focusing on carbon, then you're missing out on other problems with uh, environmental problems, such as the product, production of radioactive toxic wastes. Uh, and so you're trading one for the other. But the second point is something that uh, my friend Emery Lowens likes to say, you know, we should be thinking about two or three different things. We have to think about how, it's not just about how much carbon is being produced or not produced. It's also how much it costs to cut the carbon emissions and how long it takes. And nuclear power, because of how long these reactors take to construct, just does not meet those criteria. Thank you very. 
And I just want to say, I'm, I'll be sharing my slides. So I noticed that there were people who were asking for the thing. You're welcome to take the Dilbert cartoon at that point. Wonderful. Thank you. I think we're ready to go move on, Susan. Thank you so much, Ramana. Thank you, Ramana. Thank you, Paula. David Kraft is a co-founder and current director of Nuclear Energy Information Service, otherwise known as NICE, which provides the public with information about radiation hazards and alternative to nuclear power. will address the intersection between nuclear power and nuclear weapons. David. Thank you. We'll get share screen going here. Uh, just by way of correction, we, we pronounce it NICE because we want to be as bland as possible and non-controversial. So uh, let's see if we can get this going. All right. Uh, actually, my presentation could be done in one slide, which I hope will advance next. Can people see this? Did it advance? No. No, it did not. OK, we're having this problem again earlier. I apologize for this. Um, Just try clicking on it on the left. That will do well enough. Click on your David statue. Oh, yes. David statue did come up. That's good. Um, no, I'm sorry, it didn't for us. <laughs> not for you. Okay. That window that we are not seeing. All right, hold on a second. I'm just going to go it from here then. Make life easy. We have too little time. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of history, but then I'm going to take us to the very, very current Ukrainian situation in seven minutes, I hope. Uh, for a long time, we have known and we have talked about the connection between reactors and uh, and the weapon system. And my friend and colleague, uh, Alfred Meyer, I think puts it most succinctly that nuclear power has always been the fig leaf for nuclear weapons. And I appreciate him for uh, modeling for this slide. So, um, As we know, uh, much of the nuclear uh, dialogue is, is just a lot of misinformation, a lot of manufactured uh, talking points, things that really don't matter. It's ironic that in both cases, though, the mushrooms that are, are uh, created require an awful lot of excrement in order to grow and that's exactly what has happened with the history of nuclear power and nuclear weapons. Short histories, uh, many of you know this, I saw a lot of silver hair in the attendees uh, as I was looking over the bomb in 45, the Atomic Energy Commission here, but it gets a little interesting around 1952 to 1957 where documents have shown that the utilities like our local Illinois Commonwealth Edison, which has morphed into Exelon Corporation, now turning into Constellation, uh, was studying way back in 1951-1952 to create a dual purpose reactor which would create uh, power electricity for the commercial sector but would also be selling the plutonium back to the government uh, in exchange for the uranium it would need from the Atomic Energy Commission to run the reactors. Unfortunately, there was a congressional ban at that point for commercial involvement in nuclear power, which was overcome in 1954 by a congressional amendment to the Atomic Energy Act. And then finally, things really got rolling in 1956 when uh, that act was amended and the utilities started to get on board. Uh, and I'm not making this up. Uh, what we have here, it's, it's very dense and the slides will be made available later. This was a quotation from the 1952 Commonwealth Edison Annual Report to the stockholders, which pretty much says they have conducted a study over the last year. They have found two reactor designs that are promising, but only, and I underscore only, uh, only economically viable if a value were assigned to plutonium, meaning they intended to sell the plutonium back to the government in order to pay for the project because the expense was so great. You probably have heard the, the phrase, swords into plowshares. Unfortunately, we have gone in the opposite direction, which uh, is part of the mushroom feed that I was alluding to earlier. This is a book from 1979, which goes into some detail on the connections of uh, military and civilian nuclear projects together. I list here uh, some history, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, that the swords uh, coming from plowshares, we have a great number of examples. France, India, Pakistan, Korea, and Israel all got their bombs from the so-called peaceful and research reactors that were within their borders. 
Uh, we have aspiring countries now, like Egypt and Saudi Arabia, who are, again, building peaceful reactors, as we know. But why are they building them? And this is a quote I do want to read because I think it's important from the uh, former director of the IAEA in 2005. He won the Nobel Prize, Mohammed El Baradai, who said uh, in an article which appeared in the Washington Post, you really don't, you don't really even need to have a nuclear weapon. It's enough to buy yourself an insurance policy by developing the capability and then sitting on it. Let's not kid ourselves. 90% of it is insurance, a deterrence, meaning that any of the peaceful research reactors that are being sown around the world like wild oats will come back as a boomerang at some point to intimidate or to haunt uh, the rest of us. Uh, most recently, and I know my friend uh, Alfred Meyer would quote this, uh, former Secretary of Energy uh, Ernest Moniz made it very clear that the national security of the nation is tied into the continuation of nuclear power. And he has said this both uh, as in his capacity within the Obama administration, but also in the private entity that he created after he left that to promote nuclear power. And one only has to take a look at some of the recent legislation of the last two years where legislators are proposing that uh, fixed cost contracts be entered into with the U.S. military so that electricity can be purchased by the Department of Defense at a fixed rate to subsidize the new modular reactors that uh, people are intending to build, as well as subsidizing the old reactors, which as we know are uneconomic. So, this is from the horse's mouth. This is not made up by you know, activists who have been drinking Kool-Aid too long. This has been very much their atten intention since 1946, and it continues to this day. And again, a most blatant uh, example of that is the recent conference that the TVA held in January at the Watts Bar uh, reactor, where one of the reactors there has been producing tritium, which as many of you know, is an enhancer for hydrogen bombs. Uh, they want to up the production from roughly 1,800 of these tritium-producing rods to 2,500. So again, civilian nuclear power is contributing to the nuclear weapons stockpile through this Watts Bar upgrade. And finally, something we don't talk about is the, the way that depleted uranium, the residues from making uh, reactor fuel, is available for, for not uh, fissionable weapons, but certainly nuclear weapons that have been distributed around the world in the wars that have taken place all over. Uh, this is the stockpile I could gather of uh, depleted uranium, uh, mostly in the UF-6 form, uranium hexafluoride form, uh, for Russia, United States, and worldwide. And as you can see, there's over a million tons of stuff. This is manufactured not only into the weapons and munitions, the shells, but is used in armor which resists uh, tungsten and other weaponry in the, cre in the creation of tanks and other military vehicles. I would also point out depleted uranium is used uh, for wing stabilizers in large jet planes and in the hulls of certain ships to add stability. So depleted uranium is making it around the world even without a nuclear exchange. And finally, reprocessing needs to be looked at as an example of the crossover between weapons and power. We already know it's been going on in France, England, Russia, and sort of in Japan. There have been failures along the line. Uh, the United States tried it in the 60s. In the Illinois, we have the General Electric Morris operation, which failed. Uh, One minute. Okay. The Global Nuclear Energy Partnership of 2007 and 8 was the second U.S. failure. Japan's Manju and Rokasho reactors, a breeder reactor and a reprocessing plant, failed to the tune of over $20 billion. And now the proposal by Holtec and others to centralize the storage of radioactive waste opens the prospect that there will be reprocessing facilities taking place in Texas and New Mexico if those licenses are granted. So nuclear exchanges, they don't have to be of the atomic bomb variety, as I pointed out. We've used depleted uranium around the world. We've had accidents and leaks at places like Mayak, Hanford, Windscale, and many others. And of course, uranium mining in the indigenous lands around the world of Niger, Australia, Canada, and the United States. Nuclear reactors don't are themselves weapons, as we have found out uh, in the history 
at uh, Osirak in Iran and Iraq in the Balkans, uh, the Israeli and the United States bombing Syrian reactors and Iraqi reactors, and now, most urgently, the situation taking place in the uh, eastern part of, U of Ukraine. And we would point out that not only nuclear reactors, but the facilities around them can be nuclear tech targets. Uh, the reactors in Ukraine use dry casks, which are housed in buildings not as well secured as reactors, so they could become targets for the kinds of weapons that we are anticipating would be used in a war. Now I put this map up. Uh, the star on the right is the Donbass region of Ukraine. Uh, that would be the expected route coming from Russia into Ukraine if war does break out. But more importantly, the northern part of Ukraine is bordered to Belarus. And as you can see, there are four nuclear plants at Rivni and the Chernobyl complex just a, a few miles south of the border with Belarus. These are all potential targets in a shooting war. And why is this significant? The Zaporizhia reactors, it's the largest mm -hmm. nuclear... Mm -hmm. I have one slide left, we'll be finishing. Okay. Uh, this is the largest complex of nuclear power plants. These reactors uh, have 1.2 meter thick containment buildings uh, and uh, the, I had mentioned there are dry casks there as well. These are older Soviet VVER reactors. But I, I list this slide and it should be uh, noted that the penetration value of shoulder held modern weapons is more than capable of certainly destroying dry casks but potentially doing hazard and danger to the reactors themselves. And these are just the shoulder held weapons. The more sophisticated artillery and tank rounds that are available would make nuclear power plants uh, a disaster in terms of what they could do in spreading radiation. And of course we know what that means in terms of Chernobyl. Chernobyl no longer even has the old containment, they just have the sarcophagus. So I thank you for that and I would uh, welcome any questions you have now and I will be sticking around at the end for questions at the end of the session. This slideshow will be available uh, for anyone who would like it as well. Thank, thank you. you so much, David. Paula. Thank you so much, David. Uh, I have a big question and a small question. And uh, when you showed the dry casts at, in the Ukraine, that was very moving. Uh, and, but I know that we have dry casts right here, for instance, at, at Pilgrim uh, nuclear power plant. So uh, I'm just wondering about the radioactivity in a dry cast. My understanding is that each cask holds as much radioactivity as what was released in Fukushima. Uh, so we need to be aware of the potential for malignant or accidental uh, destruction of the dry cast. And there was a question in the uh, chat about the near disaster at the Fermi nuclear power plant in Detroit in 1966. So those are your two questions. Well, let's start with the first one. Uh, the reactor sites I put up of Ukraine, those were the reactors. And as I said, they do use dry casks there. Um, and it, as you're pointing out, we also have them here. Uh, that's why I contrasted that with the weapons chart to show how urgent and that problem is. But don't forget, at least in our case in the United States, transportation is becoming a significant issue and the transport casts have already been demonstrated to be penetrated by shoulder held weapons at facilities in the United States. Uh, Kevin Camps from Beyond Nuclear has shown slides of this. Um, even some of the silly tests of transport casts being rammed by trains and trucks uh, were actually fudged and show how vulnerable transportation casks are. So you're absolutely right. Even though the radiation content has, is much lower than when you immediately take the reactor out of uh, the fuel out of the spent fuel pools, there will be residual radiation for quite a while, and that can be released to the environment. Um, the Fermi reactor in Detroit, I really don't know the exact details about, although uh, it was a smaller breeder reactor, which obviously did not work, and it did melt down. Uh, beyond that, I really couldn't comment on it. And you're on mute. Right. Okay. We have a, another minute and a half, and a question came up in the unlikely event that we have a revolution and establish a government less focused on corporate profit. Can you speculate on nuclear power becoming a non-carbon energy source without the concurrent development of nuclear weapons? 
No. No. Okay. <laughs> I, the point, the whole point of the show is, uh, as as we started out with the first slide, and as my colleague Alfred Meyer is wont to point out, uh, it's a fig leaf. Uh, the expense uh, is is exorbitant to run the show just for power, just for medical research. Uh, it's really there to. Uh, the whole infrastructure is exactly the same, except for the concentration involved of the fuel. Uh, whereas you have a four, two to four percent in reactor fuel. Now we're talking about the HALU fuel, which could go to 19.9 percent enrichment. Nuclear weapons grade uh, uh, fuel going up to 90 percent and beyond. So it's a matter of enrichment, but the scientists are the same, the structures are the same, the national labs are the same, the technology is the same, and the physics is the same. Thank you, you like so me much. To say a bit about Thank the you. Thank reactor. you. Okay, let's go on to Deb Katz, and we'll just go right from Deb to Diane, and then we'll take questions for the two of them. I think that's how you you phrased it, uh, Paula. Yeah. Okay. Oh, whoops. Let me just go back here. Um, and Deb Katz. Deb is the executive director of Citizens Awareness Network a nonprofit volunteer grassroots regional organization fighting for clean air, democracy, and environmental justice in New England. Deb. Thank you. So I want to tell a cautionary tale. My town was host to the Yankee Row Reactor. Why? Because we're a working poor farming community in Western Massachusetts. The reactor sits on the banks of the Deerfield River that winds through nine small towns in our valley. We knew there were dangers with nuclear power, with the accidents at Three Mile Island in Chernobyl, but those were accidents and we thought we were safe. When lightning struck the reactor in 1991, citizens began meeting, fearing what could happen if there was an accident. The Union of Concerned Scientists said if there was, the reactor could shatter like glass, releasing radioactive waste into the river. Alarm grew, meetings overflowed with people. The corporation began holding meetings as well in local towns. In a packed school gymnasium, we raised concerns about an accident, the contamination of our river. A chemist got up from the reactor and said, hell, we've been dumping in your river for 30 years. What's the difference? What's the difference? Shock. The river is the lifeblood of our community. Why didn't we know? A group of us started researching what the reactor dumped into the river. What we found? It routinely, regularly released radioactive waste where our kids swam, where we fished, boated, in water we used to irrigate crops and drought. Our schools are on the banks of that river. Was this legal? Wasn't it the NRC's job to protect our river, to protect us? Not only did the company pollute the river, it cooled the reactor with the river water, sucking hundreds of millions of gallons of river water every day, only to return heated water that undermined the river and destroyed aquatic life. And it's legal. Our river didn't matter, nor did we. The corporation mattered. This company controlled our waterways and our lives. It bought our silence by donating needed services like ambulances, school computers, science classes. People were afraid to speak openly. Those that did were threatened and ostracized. There was a thin veneer of civility hiding a dangerous undercurrent. To this day, the fabric of my community is rent. I lost friends and neighbors in this fight. In the face of this, we pulled together to shut row. That was the beginning of the Citizens Awareness Network. Then mothers worried about the high numbers of children with Down syndrome asked for our help. We created a health committee with the mothers, local health professionals, and a team of experts. What we learned, we never wanted to know. How radioactive waste released into our river caused cancer, mutations, and birth defects. We suffered an epidemic of disease. 
with statistical significance in cancers, a tenfold increase in children with Down syndrome, high rates of miscarriage, heart disease, immune deficiency diseases, and children with disabilities. Less than 8,000 people live in our valley. There shouldn't be any statistical significance. People blame themselves for their illnesses rather than the corporation and its deadly waste. We paid our electric bills at our medical centers. Our community suffered an unbearable assault, but it's not unusual. This is the reality for all nuclear co communities. We did shut row. Then the corporation announced it would ship its low level waste to Barnwell, South Carolina, a 46% African American community. We couldn't accept that the waste that hurt us could hurt another. We fought those shipments, raising awareness about the industry's environmental racism. What remains at row? 40 million curies of high level waste on the banks of the Deerfield with no destination and no solution. The industry's plan? Targeting working poor Hispanic communities in the Southwest for temporary storage. Temporary, this waste will be dangerous for a million years. For all its claims, nuclear power is neither clean nor green. It's a dirty, toxic technology. It relies on its invisibility to keep its lies going. When its lies fail, its intimidation fails, it falls back on a captive regulator to protect it. Clean water, clean air, clean land and a safe place to live or a human right. Can fights for the cleanup of all communities. We work to stop the targeting of black, brown, and white communities alike to nuclear contamination. We wake people up in a world that wants them to stay asleep. Wow, Deb, thank you for that very uh, moving and ethical presentation. Thank you. We'll go to Diane. Diane Turco is the executive director of Cape Down Winders, a Cape Cod volunteer community grassroots organization with the mission to investigate, educate, and agitate for protection of people and environment from ongoing threats to communities from Holtec Pilgrims decommissioning plans and nuclear waste dump at the site in Plymouth, Massachusetts. Diane. There's no Thank questions you. for Deb? Uh, no, we'll take those questions together. Great. Okay. Thank you, Deb. I'm following on in your path. And Cole, you have the slides? I have the slides, the slides, of Thank course. <laughs> Okay. How's that look? Okay. That's... Okay. In, in Cape Town Windows, we're looking at everyone across the country. We're all nuclear neighbors and we're all here to protect the earth and our people. And as Deb said, there's such a connection from what's happening right in our own backyards to what's happening in New Mexico and across the country. Um, so the next slide, Cole. So what is happening here? today a Pilgrim. Pilgrim shut down um, in 2019 and Holtec Corporation bought Pilgrim and now they are decommissioning the reactor site. And if you know anything about Holtec, they have a horrible track record. Uh, the corporation is, is, um, has been uh, involved with corruption and bribery and we are connecting with the folks in New Mexico where Holtec is attempting to build a centralized interim storage. But what's happening right now at Pilgrim is they are trying to um, get rid of over a million gallons of radioactive water. And what they have said is that they will, would like to dump it in the bay. They're denying that now, but they did say they wish to dump the water in the bay. Their other two um, options are to truck it out of state to another facility or to let it evaporate. And neither one of those is, is workable right now, according to Holtec. Um, so we are fighting them from that dumping. Okay, next slide. And, and we also know too, 
what's going to happen when it gets dumped. Um, the Massachusetts has authority to stop it. Um, the, we are not preempted regarding economic concerns. So the fishermen in the fishing industry, um, the coastal communities and their livelihoods are all being impacted by this potential dumping into the bay. Um, so our attorney general, our legislators are working to find a way to stop this, but they have not hit that button yet. Next slide. So Holtec has said that they will, you know, the NRC and the, the Environmental Protection Agency and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission have strict regulations regarding disposal of this effluent, but that's not true. These, both these, these agencies are captured by the industry. And Holtec also said that they wouldn't charge, discharge any water in 2022 while this evaluation is undertaken. And we underline that because a lot of folks thought, well, they're not gonna dump in 2022 so we can relax a little bit. But while this evaluation is undertaken, that means that evaluation could stop tomorrow. So we are keeping the hot spotlight on Holtec. Next slide. Next cycle. Okay, thanks. So we're looking at the economic damage that the state has control over and the fishing industry is right on board. In fact, we're having a demonstration in Plymouth on Sunday at noon at the Plymouth Rock. And it's being organized by the shell fishermen, the seafood organizations and um, the uh, businesses in that area. So next slide. So dumping isn't safe. We know this water will have radionuclides going into the bay, getting into the sediment and working its way up the food chain. Holtec is telling us nothing's going to happen. It's going to dilute and go away. And we know that's not true. Um, so we are fighting this and we have this uh, slide of how the water just keeps circulating in Cape Cod Bay. A scientist from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute agreed with us and said this would be a dangerous precedent because it would contaminate the bay. Okay, next slide. Okay, and so let's look at Holtec in the bigger picture too. They are planning a centralized interim storage facility in New Mexico. And what they're telling us is that they are going to take our waste and dump it in the backyard of indigenous people, low-income communities. And just like Deb said, we are against that um, move. But also too, on the other side, the New Mexican government has filed a lawsuit against uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And in that they name Holtec. And they say that Holtec has provided multiple fundamental misrepresentations. Um, they uh, don't, the NRC does not fault Holtec for misrepresentations, omissions, and lack of financial assurance for their centralized interim storage. And that Holtec license would permanently damage the nuclear, the uh, New Mexican economy. And that's exactly what would happen here on Cape Cod. If they release that water, it will permanently damage the economy of our whole area. So, so yeah, Holtec is doesn't care. They're all in to just make their money and get out of town quick. And the whole decommissioning there is fast, dirty, and cheap. And we need to be paying attention to that. Next slide. So in addition to the dumping in the bay, we have 61 cans of highly radioactive waste sitting in Plymouth. The town of Plymouth is a nuclear waste dump. And Holtec came to town and promised that the waste would be moving out by 2024. And that was another big lie. People thought we don't have to worry about it, it's going to be leaving. But they're in these Holtec cans that can't be monitored. The waste can't be retrieved. They don't meet the American Society for Mechanical Engineers safety requirements. They can't be repaired or replaced. They can't be transported. And the NRC has given exemptions for safety standards. That's in our backyard right now. Next slide. Diane, we have okay, so ten one minute. Ten okay, seconds. yeah, I'm just about done. Here is the here are the cans. You can see these cans right off of busy Rocky Hill Road in Plymouth, Massachusetts. And David talked about the uh, shoulder launched weapons. You can see the vents in these cans clearly from the road. These are like bowling pins for terrorists. We want we need hardened on site storage, real security. You can walk up to the fence and nobody will tell you to leave. Um, we need monitoring of each can. There's not, there's no radiation monitoring there. We need a hot cell in case we need to have it repaired and we need emergency plans. There are none. Okay, next slide. I think I'm just about done here. And so what you can do, 
This slide will be up so folks can follow up, but there's a few things you can do here. There is legislation at the State House. Um, there's legislation, legislation for monitoring each can. We need Governor Baker to step up and oppose the dumping. And we ask people to attend the nuclear decommissioning citizens panels that are every other month. Okay. Is Thank that you so much. Okay. A lot, a lot. Yeah, it is a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Paula. Good question. Great. Thank you so much, Deb and Diane. You're really getting to the heart of what's going on here, which is the NRC mm -hmm. and what they're doing. So there's a question for Diane. We can see that Holtec is interested in cutting costs, and this is presumably how they increase their profits. How does the revenue side what I guess they mean, what does the revenue side look like? Do they get the same amount yeah. of money regardless of what they do or are payments linked to their costs? No, they, they are using the decommissioning trust fund, which is ratepayer money, not their money, that they got when they bought Pilgrim for $1,000. They got a $1.03 billion decommissioning trust fund to use to clean up Pilgrim. But what has happened is the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which is the lapdog of the industry, has allowed um, Holtec to use that money for waste management. It was never meant to be used for waste management. So Holtec takes out of the decommissioning trust fund, buys its own cheap cans, moves it all, and then they sue the Department of Energy for those funds because the Department of Energy failed in their promise to take the waste in 1999. So not only does Holtec double dip and take the money out of the nuclear waste, um, the nuclear decommissioning trust fund, they sue DOE and put that money in their pocket. So they're really double dipping and not, and they're buying their own cheap cans. So if the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is uh, bought up by the industry, who else can we go to once the NRC gives permission? This is both to Deb and Diane because the NRC is the rule. Well, Senator you know. Markey is fighting. Senator Markey is fighting all of this. Our, our senators, we're lucky in Massachusetts. Go ahead, Deb. I look. One of the things we learned in Western Massachusetts, we started off in a naive notion that the NRC and the EPA was going to protect us. And it became absolutely clear that they abdicated their responsibility to do anything, but to make sure that these reactors would continue to operate. And we've closed four reactors in New England, and we have learned that at each site. And what has closed the reactors is mobilizing people and waking them up to understand the atrocity of nuclear power, that it engages in human sacrifice. And it, in fact, even wrote a paper about it. There was a woman who submitted a paper to the NRC saying that the NRC should be brought up on charges before, before the Hague because they engaged in human sacrifice. And you would think the NRC would blow this off, right? Her name was Honecker. And but they wrote a 25 page legal document saying because they didn't choose the people that nuclear power was going to kill, that it wasn't then a crime against humanity, but that a certain number of people were going to die from the process of nuclear power's operation. <laughs> uh, Diane, uh, another question that just came in is the Massachusetts Department of Public Health monitoring or regulating any nuclear waste storage or disposal? If not, why not? They don't have the power. No, they, they so do not normal monitoring. It. Yeah, they do monitor, but they don't have the power to do anything about it. They don't have the power. The, the um, Atomic Energy Act gave the NRC sole responsibility, ugh, whatever that means, um, to uh, regulate nuclear the Except state economically yeah the state can deal with environmental issues they could make the choice to not have an operating reactor in their state but the issues of safety fall to the nrc it's a bifurcated process and there was a ruling that took place in the um 
appellate court in California that determined that went to the Supreme Court and validated that position. Now, I think we have time for one more question here, um, or maybe two. Do small nuclear, do the SMRs, the small module, modular nuclear reactors have similarly dangerous impacts and waste issues as these large nuclear power plants? Bill Gates and Warren Buffett are supporting the development of the SMRs and deploying them by the Columbia River in Washington state. Well, Germany, built an SMR that supposedly was not going to create, have any accidents. They had an accident with it, it released radiation, and they decided to never build them. But basically what they're gambling is creating an experiment and, you know, throwing as many things against the barn as they can, basically to keep a bankrupt industry going. I mean, this is what it's about. It's as David connected to, you know, weapons, they need the tritium, they need other things, the byproducts of nuclear power to keep their business going. And Holtec is in the business of small modular reactors and they're talking about putting one at Oyster Creek in New Jersey. Right. Wow. I, would, I would add uh, the Union of Concerned Scientists did an excellent report last year uh, critiquing some of these small modular designs. I'll try and get the URL put in the chat before uh, we end tonight, but people should make sure they save the chat to save all those URLs. Absolutely. And Ramana, I know SMRs are your, your topic also. <laughs> yeah, i just say very quickly, all nuclear reactors will produce waste. There is no escaping that. That's just physics. Uh, mm -hmm. And all reactors uh, also do risk, have the risk of accidents. Now, in terms of the specific design that uh, Terra Power is, is promoting, that's a very well-known uh, reactor design called a sodium fast reactor. And these are special safety challenges uh, that I think uh, Deb talked about in the case of Germany. Uh, and uh, also they have sort of linked to nuclear weapons uh, because they have to use uh, highly enriched uranium of plutonium. Uh, and they are easily, uh, and so there are lots of problems with that particular design. And I think the last thing to mention is that it's interesting that Bill Gates, who certainly has more than enough money to be able to build one of these, has to go to DOE to get, you know, $40 million and then, you know, $2 billion later on. Okay, can I just uh, jump in and say, if you're not speaking, could you please mute? Thanks so much. Go on, Paula. Yes, thank you. Some wonderful sounds of children and dogs, but it's hard to integrate, reminds us of why we're here, actually. So we only have five minutes left and I'd like to give each speaker, first Ramana, then Dave, then uh, Deb, and then Diane, one minute to say if there's one thing you would like the participants in this uh, session to take away with them, what would that be? Yeah, Ramana. just in yeah, okay. In line with my uh, presentation, I would say that uh, these, all this talk about uh, small modular reactors is just hype. They're going to have exactly the same kind of problems and sometimes could be worse, uh, including the cost, uh, uh, the problem of cost. Uh, and that's the one thing you should remember when you're reading all this hype that you see very regularly in the media. Thank you, David. You're muted, David. I just put the UCS report link in the chat, by the way. Um, honestly, uh, I'm going to go a different direction. Uh, as, I, as I looked at the number of people here and, and who they are, as I said earlier, there's a ton of silver and, and gray hair here. Uh, and to me, this is most worth, well, for those of you who have it anyway, uh, um, that is most worrisome to me. And I would like to recommend that we all make a much bigger effort to start getting into university environmental groups and clubs, getting presentations there, and start making contacts between our organizations and the environmental groups at colleges and universities. Uh, I'm uh, impressed at how much of this material the students I've run across do not know, and how much they are inclined to parrot the bullshit about nuclear as a climate solution and, and that. Uh, I really think we have to shift our emphasis because let's, let's face it folks, a lot of us aren't gonna be here on a call like this in 10 years. That's our timeline. 
we, we got to start growing a new generation of activists. Thank you, David. And so true. So true. Thank you. Deb, please. Uh, you're muted, Deb. Let's unmute you. There's a crisis in nuclear waste at this point. The NRC and the federal, the federal government and the industry have basically abdicated their responsibility to be responsible for the most toxic waste that has ever been created. And what they are engaging in is advertising campaigns to basically try their wet dream again of another nuclear reticence. This is irresponsible and dangerous. And I agree with Dave, that the work is really to reach out, not just to young people, but to the uh, climate change people, because in a certain way, the industry, the nuclear industry pits reactor and targeted communities against each other. So we fight over who gets screwed last. And in a certain way, the we have the same struggle with carbon and the fight about what's worse. And our job is not to fight over what's worst, but to fight for what's best. And that requires all of us fighting together at this point, you know, not just for ourselves, but for many generations. And we fall into this, this need to, uh, to see ourselves in an isolated way. And we really, we'll either hang separately or we'll hang together. And if we hang together, we'll win. Beautiful, thank you, Deb. Diane, please. Yeah. Right, and again, following Deb, uh, you know, this is just like the tobacco industry of the 50s and 60s, putting out, don't worry about it, everything's gonna be fine. And when you see those cans lined up on Rocky Hill Road, open to any kind of terrorist act and Holtec and the industry is saying, don't worry about it. and our government is ineffective in, in protecting us. They have been for decades. So I would say people, yes, join an organization, get out in the street. When there's a demonstration, get there, write your letters, write letters to the editor, invite scientists to your community and organize, organize. And I think it's up to the people to really make that change. I would That's just all. say one other thing, which is talk to the people you don't feel comfortable talking to. All we do is talk to ourselves. And in a certain way, we don't get anywhere because of that. We have to be willing to risk talking to people where we're not sure they're going to like what we have to say. And that dialogue is essential to create any kind of energy revolution at this point. We have to all be uncomfortable and commit to being that. And Deb, I want to say in that context, that we have mediators and dialogue facilitators who are ready to help communities develop dialogue across ideo ideological lines. So um, yep. I could put my email in the uh, in yep. the chat if people want to have dialogue facilitation. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Paula. I'm just going to jump in now to say it. It's eight o'clock. Oh, actually, it's eight oh one. And uh, thank you to our excellent panelists and participants. Uh, it's eight o'clock, our stated end time. Uh, however, there's so many uh, questions still out there. Uh, we can stay for another fifteen minutes. For those of you who are interested and able, for those of you who are leaving, thank you for being with us, and please share, spread this information. I'm going to pass it back to you, Paula. Thank you so much, Susan. So we have another nine minutes or so. I see some hands in the in the chat. Uh, I don't see questions in the chat, but I see hands that are raised. Oh, yeah. Teresa, uh, Amin, do you want to ask a question? You have to unmute yourself. There you are. Hi. Would you like to ask a question? Well, okay, because it kept saying the host won't let you unmute. Uh, now you, you're unmuted now, Teresa, but we hear you. 
Well, good. What I put in the chat is you need to stop being so white. Uh, this is a movement where environmental racism is unbelievable. Uh, there's a place in Georgia called Shell Bluff where Georgia Power Southern Company has two nuclear plants and they're building two more. And Nuclear Watch South is fighting them. Uh, but what's really important is that the Plowshares Fund has put out the Equity Rises proposal. And we are all, us Black folks are all moving to apply. And I want to make sure that some of you are applying uh, because the grant uh, concept note is due February 15th. So hopefully you already know about it, but you should be applying so that you can integrate the movement so that you will reach out to people <laughs> of color and indigenous people because this is outrageous to have all white everything when you're talking about environmental racism and everything that's going on. These, these companies in the South have gone wild with these nuclear power plants and we need support. We need your solidarity. It works two ways. And I did put my information in the chat directly to you, Deb, because I need you to come south and speak. Your, your, your presentation was so powerful. We need you, Deb. We really need you. I'll come. Once COVID, well, you, you got we got to get through COVID and then I'll come. Yeah, and well, I have a crew, potentially you can come with me. We've been in the South. We went to Barnwell, South Carolina. We protested at Chem Nuclear where the waste was going. We did it. We went along the transport routes. I hear you, Teresa, and I agree. And in well, I talked to I talked to Maggie Gunderson today. You probably heard of her. Uh, we are really gearing up in the sound right now. So come on down. But Deb, you didn't send me your contact information, but I sent you mine. Uh, my contact information, I put it in the chat to you. Oh, I, I'm on my phone so I can get it. Uh, but you have mine, so yes. call me or email yes. me or whatever. I will. I absolutely will. I want to make a connection. Absolutely, Teresa. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. I mean, the story you told is so powerful and everybody's got to hear it. I lived in the Boston, Rhode Island area, and I'm just shocked to hear that this is going on in the People's Republic of Boston. <laughs> well, Teresa, we're so grateful that you attended this and event and that you're sharing this with us. Thank you so very much for being here. Well, I just think Massachusetts Peace Action rocks and I really appreciate being on your list. So keep me on your list because Massachusetts Peace Action rocks. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Let me just uh, jump you. in for a minute and say yeah. that for anybody who came, who uh, entered the program a little bit later, please put your information and uh, anything else you would like in the chat. And all of this, this program will be sent to you uh, a few days, in a few days, and we'll put in uh, lots of um, uh, uh, action items and resources. Thanks so much, Paula. Yeah, uh, I see a hand, Jesse Free, Freestone. You need to unmute. Sorry for the delay. Try now, Jesse. Okay, there we go. Great. Um, I have to say uh, that I'm a little disappointed with the conversation today because there's no discussion of, of like getting down our carbon emissions and 
Uh, I'm a little disillusioned as a 35 year old, given that I was told solar and wind could do it. And uh, I've been looking at Germany who spent 500 billion euros on wind and solar and their emissions have barely dropped. And you compare it to places like Ontario, where I'm from originally, and France, and they had great decarbonization success with nuclear. And it just seems like if you don't have hydroelectric, then uh, wind and solar, because of their intermittency, always mean that also you'll have to burn gas or coal or some sort of fossil fuel. And if somebody could point me towards something else, that would be great. Because honestly, I hear you guys talking about tritium is going to kill us all. And... I'm like, no, no, no. Carbon we hear you, Jesse. And, we hear you, Jesse. And, and we're so glad. Jesse, and I'm not scared so of here. Can I, can I respond and quickly? I, I think that the, 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 the claim about Germany is completely wrong. German emissions have come down by 40%. Okay. They've met more than their target in terms of electricity. I put a link right here uh, right. on the on the thing where I've sort of talked about. And inter, the, the all sources of electricity are intermittent. Okay, they are intermittent on different scales, right? So a nuclear power plant also has to be shut down, uh, albeit on a different schedule, okay? And there are, pro all grids have to be managed because neither the supply nor the demand is going to be constant, okay? And there is no uh, reason why a grid that is fully based on solar and wind cannot be managed. And again, we have sort of looked at this in great detail. You can look at our article, okay? Okay. Thank and you. Ontario, by the way, is increasing its emissions because it's planning to build gas plants. Just want to add that. Dave, did you want to add something? Well, actually, I wanted to, I wanted to back up uh, to Teresa's comment and offer an opportunity for the, all of us in the movement to do something about it. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, our senator, Tammy Duckworth, was at a presentation here in Illinois boasting about he, how she was one of the co-founders of the Senate Environmental Justice Caucus, along with Cory Booker, um, a couple others whose name I forget at the moment. The point was, you know, uh, they were going to be championing environmental issues as environmental justice issues. And in a presentation she was giving, I kind of confronted her with this idea about, uh, well, you know, nuclear is a significant environmental justice issue, and we would request that you and your caucus hold Senate hearings and meetings to talk about that. And of course, we never heard back from her. But I want to push that because this is an election year coming up and some of those senators are coming up for uh, election. Uh, I can't remember offhand if Cory Booker is one of them, but we should take a look at who's on that caucus and really start pressing them for public hearings so that we can get the activists from uh, where Teresa lives, from Texas, where the CIS facility is proposed, from New Mexico, where CIS is proposed, and get them to come to Washington to testify what a serious environmental justice issue this is. Now, I will end that on a, a down note that the White House's Advisory Committee on Environmental Justice said nuclear and nuclear waste are not good for communities, and, and the Biden administration just blew them off. But the point is we have to raise the issue, and we have to make it public, we have to make it loud, and we have to make it personal. And this is an election year, which gives you an opportunity to make it very, very personal. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dave. I see one last question. Are we going to, do we have time for it, Susan? Yes, yes we do. Okay. One last question, but without a name, it's a phone call in and it's 847-744-1111. Uh, uh, who are you? And you have your hand up. Would you like to ask a question? Can you unmute yourself? Can we unmute you? You're unmuted. Hi, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? I can hear you, yes. Okay, Jake is my name, calling from Chicago. Thank you for the presentation. Not a question, but a comment. Number one, you forgot to mention the Price-Anderson Act in the event of a nuclear power accident. The, uh, the uh, people who cause the accident are only liable for a small fraction of the damages. This is how it's been since the early 1960s. This is in the United States. I don't know how it is in other countries. But the point is, we, if there's a nuclear power plant, the victims of the accident end up paying for the damages. The other 
The other thing I meant to mention when you're talking about Ukraine is that the Chernobyl the um, Chernobyl reactor, it turns out, is actually a military reactor designed for military purposes. The electricity is just a byproduct. Mm-hmm. And this is this is why after the accident happened, the Soviet government was so hush hush about it. They didn't want anybody to know about it. Okay, thank thank you very much. Uh, Romana, or uh, do you want to comment? Does anyone want to comment? Or? No, I think it's fine. Yeah. Just, just quickly, uh, yeah, I focused on the United States situation. I didn't have the opportunity to go worldwide, but uh, Jake is correct. Uh, Chernobyl was a dual purpose reactor. Most of the reactors in the Soviet Union were. Uh, but as we go around the world, uh, as I pointed out, there have been numerous nations that have gotten their nuclear material from university research reactors. So. Thank you so much. Susan, I'll let you have the last word. Thank you so much, panelists. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say all of you, the wonderful comments in chat and information that people have put in, please remember to save the chat. I'm doing it right now. Uh, And uh, thank you all. Thank you, participants. Thank you, panelists. And uh, thank you, Paula and Gordon and uh, you know, maybe we can all come on the screen and uh, say thank you together. What about that? Cole, can you make that happen? Yes, I will try, let's see here. How do we do that? We get gallery. All right, can we unmute everybody? Um, <laughs> oh, I can, I, I can allow them to unmute themselves. Yes. Okay. Unmute yourselves. Thank you all. Wonderful Thank program. You. Thank Thank you. 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 Thank Oh, oh yes. Us. It's all of us doing this together. And thank you, thank Teresa, you. for for reminding us and being here. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Have a great night.